Inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Big, big show in store for you today. Thank you so much for making us part of your day today. In hour number two of the show, we'll have a guitar player who's coming to Tucson, Al Di Miola, and he'll be followed by a country music star who's also going to be here next week, Merle Haggard. But it's now my honor to bring in... Uh, Really, uh, one of the guys that uh, you know, you look up leadership in the dictionary, and uh, there's a picture of this guy there, and it's really great to talk to him again. He's coming to Tucson next week on Tuesday. Billy Cobham, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hi, Jake. It's nice to be back online with you. It's great. It is, man. And we're 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 full live today, man. So it's it's really it's going out all over the place, and um, it's perfect. And tell me, uh, tell me, you're in Detroit right now. Yeah, we we arrived in Detroit, and uh, we'll be playing at uh, Jazz Cafe this evening here, and uh, then we'll move on to Chicago tomorrow. Or actually, Evanston at the University of uh, North Evanston University. Yeah, I was going to say uh, I I'm pretty giddy because I mean we had corresponded, and you were thinking about coming to the Musical Instrument Museum at the end of this year. I didn't expect you to be down in Tucson in the spring. <laughs> Nor did I. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, I mean, I'll take it any way I can get it. Thank you very much, Sandy Jalisco. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, uh, it just sort of popped up, you know, and, I, and, and it's funny. Sometimes you, everybody's thinking the same way, and that's what happens. And, and so there we are. Because I haven't, it'll be a big thing for me, a reunion with me and Danny. I have not seen Danny in almost 20 years, you know, so... It's amazing. Uh, it's uh, it's and it's good. It's fine. it's a long time coming. We've been talking about it for a while, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. Can you uh, for the audience? Uh, Danny Zalesko is a, a is a prolific promoter in the Southwest, uh, and uh, he's really been doing a heck of a job bringing in all sorts of cats. But when I read his bio, he said his his life was changed by uh, a concert he taught. He saw uh, the uh, opening track we played was uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. Which was featuring Billy on the drums. Did he tell you that night? Did you? Did, did he ever relay that story to you about the fact that that put him on a trajectory to become a promoter of of great music? If he did, I must have been drunk, man, because I don't remember it. <laughs> okay, okay. It's just. It's, it's, I think it's. I think it's cool that. Uh, I mean, I can see why he was. I can see why he was uh, was moved by that because um, I don't know. I was taking a look at this Munich concert from seventy two and and. Uh, I mean, you were. T- we talked, I think, in our first interview about you know breathing, and uh, you know you would go through these you know rapid fire sort of uh, you know progressions after, and then someone would st- stop, and then somebody else would take a solo, and you'd readjust. But it was all about. I mean, it, it looked like you were running a fast break on the basketball court. All of you were unbelievable. Rick Laird, Jan, John. But I can see why Danny was so affected as an audience member because mm-hmm. you you. You know, there's no. You go to a show like that, and there's really no time to be internal. There's no time to think, and if you are, you don't belong there because what you're witnessing on stage is magic, really magic. It's still what you do today, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the thing about about all of that is, you get a group of people who are thinking the same way, who are all respectful of each other, and. It's, it's, it, it shows what can happen. If you've got a whole crowd to work, to lift uh, the pyramids, 
it, it would work if everybody was thinking the same way at, at the same time. Uh, with music, it's just, it's absolutely the same. It's an absolute uh, a re reflection of that. And when you get people together who believe in, uh, in the music, no matter what they do off stage, who they are off stage as individuals, all of a sudden things lock right up because they're listening to each other and they're working off of each other. That's very, very beautiful, very special. Can you talk about the current band that you're with that the people in Tucson at the Fox are, are going to be able to see? Yes. I'll start with the, the, the one person who has uh, been with me really uh, over a major portion of my career, off and on, uh, always doing something with me from time to time. Sometimes years will go by and we do nothing, two, three years. Mm -hmm. But that's, generally speaking, every, when we come back together, Dean Brown's there. Mm -hmm. I never have to worry about him. <laughs> uh, I know who he is. I know, I, I know his family. I know his general makeup as a person. Uh, I, I know his emotions and how he wears them. And it comes out through the music. It's it, Dean is Dean, you know. Now uh, he's not he's not going to be everybody's player, but for me, he's Mister Consistency. He's he's always the same. And uh, since nineteen what eighty one, we've been working together. And then after Dean uh, comes Gary Husband, whom I met a ballpark around nineteen about nineteen eighty eight or thereabouts, and. Uh, that was a, a very special time because I'd never heard uh, a drummer play piano like that. <laughs> and uh, it completely caught me off guard. Well, well, went, can you, can hey, you, so, yeah. Go, huh? Can you, can you, can, was, for, for a non-musician, can you talk about what stood out? Because I, I mean, all the pictures I see of Gary, he's got this monster drum kit, but I know he's playing piano with you. So what, what stood out to you? What stands out for me is Gary's, uh, being able to translate the percussion patterns uh, to play a piano as a as a percussionist means that you're playing rhythmic patterns that are so accurate that mm -hmm. it really you know ties a lot of things together. Because most drummers, unfortunately, with all due respect, are rhythmists first. They play figures. They play numbers. They play patterns. They synchronize the time. They support the shortcomings of all of the other musicians, bar none, in any band, any orchestra. Everybody's depending on this this individual in the, or this group of what they call the battery. And they're just boom, 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 boom. They're keeping everything together so everybody else can have some fun. And then there's some guys and gals who actually are in both camps and they play and are selective. They play synchronously and they're also extremely selective about which note to play when on what drum at, and, and again, when that is supposed to be done. That's a rarity. Okay, and when you find people like that, Man, that's what music is all about. I agree. You know, and no, that's Gary, right Gary Husband's like this. Yes. Right on. So you got Jerry and Gary. Um, yeah. Oh, Dean, we have, Dean. We have Dean. Dean yeah, Dean. And Gary. Mm -hmm. And then we have Rick Ferrabracci. Right. Rick Ferrabracci is, uh, it, it, it was introduced to me by Frank Gambali, I think, ballpark around the late late 90s we made an album uh uh of uh, frank's uh in trio and 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 uh rick Fairbrachi was one of the of two bass players on it the other guy i remember as well but not as well as 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 uh as rick who stood out because of his sound and tone his rhythmic accuracy and his uh his uh security the secure, the secure way that he played, I found it very easily easy for me to, how can I say, synchronize with him. Uh, I didn't have to to push him in a direction or work 
to make an adjustment in any way. It just felt good, you mm-hmm. know, right. and, and that was important for me. You know, so with that said, I I, I started to consider using Rick in the future. So one thing led to another. We kept trying to do some things. Uh, timing was the, was a question when he was available or when I was available. And the next thing you know, we we got something. You know, uh, it started out with uh, I mean on a on a major level in 2013, uh, working uh, on this new Spectrum tour thing because I, I I felt that he he had the personality for it. We had worked on projects before. Uh, it was not uh, with Frank. Uh, he or those guys toured with me in Europe. And it, and it felt okay, but it was still not the, not really the thing that I was looking for. And finally, it came up, and I went, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's this is where we're at. Mm. And so this is where Rick is at. That's He's true. here with us. It feels good, you're, and you're, and, and I, you know, I, I talked to Stanley Clark about this. I told him that you, you're the first cat that I heard uh, at, really put yourself out there and say, I want to go to flyover towns. I want to go to the places that, uh-huh. you know, not the urban centers because, well, I don't know, even know if you gave an answer, but the point is that what used to be the havens of live music and the cultivations of live music maybe are not so much anymore. And you, right. and I wanted you to talk about, I mean, you're in Detroit. That's obviously a, an urban center in, 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 a, in a restructuring phase of sorts, but you're going to, you said uh, a university town tomorrow, Tucson is... I mean, I interviewed Merle Haggard. I said, you like coming to Tucson? He's like, it's just the only town between El Paso and L.A. You know, it's like, but, but, but how, is that, how is that working out for you? Have you? What have you discovered on these flyover tours of Spectrum 40? That people remember us. We came, we came here to Detroit. We were in, uh, actually, we were in Indianapolis last night, and people came back saying, man, I saw you the last time. The band sounded great. I'm sure it's going to be even better this time because you guys have grown. No one says that on the, on the coast, not, not so easily. One of the reasons, they don't have time to think about what's going on in New York or L.A. That's right. Or Seattle. Right. You know, there's, there's so much stuff that's blowing by them that they have no time. Their, their, uh, their attention span is less than 30 seconds, you know. Uh, here, people are still kind of the old European school of absorbing and going, uh-huh, should I invest in this? I don't know. It, it, and that's a, not, we're not talking money. We're talking about just my time. Uh, should I stay home or should I? What is this? Let me step back and, 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 and think about it while I smell the roses. That's what I want to do. I, 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 I want to be with people... I want to play for people in Nebraska. I want to play for, I've never been to Nebraska in my life. I want to, I want to play in, in Arkansas. I want to play, you know, in, in places that I just don't get to. I'd love to play in, 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 uh, in Tennessee. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> you know, I love it, Billy. This is, you're so, I can tell you right now, man, from my own little perch, it, it, you are you are right on the pulse of where it needs to be. Uh, n- things go. They used to call it a New York minute. Now it's like a New York second. You know, and the attention. Right. I, I think that um, cultivating and understanding. I mean, it, how? I guess I wanted to talk to you about this because the last time we, uh, the first time our first interview, we talked a lot about your one of your mentors was Horace Silver, and he has left us yes. since that time. And, and the thing is, the difference is that while you said that the tours were grueling and they ultimately didn't pay enough for you to support your family. Uh, Billy, you're talking about another se- seismic change is that, okay, you, you went to Indianapolis and they remembered you from last year. But when you used to yeah. go, when you used to go to Indianapolis with Horace, you'd go for six nights, you'd go for a week and then you'd go somewhere else. So that has changed a lot too. the idea that there's, I remember Lenny White talking about people like the com- the music came out of the community. They'd come back and say, "I don't." They would come back and t- say say to you, "Hey, Billy, I saw you last night. I brought two friends, and then you brought, bring five more friends." I mean, you're now talking about one night stands, and then the next year, right? I mean, as opposed right. to those. But can you talk a little bit about um, 
the idea of playing at a place for six or seven nights like you did with Horace. And then ultimately, like with Miles, how Horace is still in you today. Okay. Well, working with Horace, he was such a great role model, model for me in that, first and foremost, you know, he, he, he didn't do everything that you wanted him to do. I mean, you, he was not a perfect, perfect, uh, I should say, godfather in a way, or for lack of a better term. He did not, he, he could not agree. You know, he, wasn't, he couldn't be good for everybody, but he had to be good to Horace first. Horace also had a family. He was out there busting his butt. And the one thing that I realized is that he had, he only had but so much. And he would always say this, man, I can only do this. It, and, and God bless you, if you can do better, don't don't worry, just go ahead and do that. I'll, you know, I'll work it out, I'll find somebody. Um, and I respected that tremendously, and I carry those that ethos with me to this day. I can't be everything to everybody else, you know? Mm-hmm. Got to just do what I can do, and I've got to stand by my 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 uh, my points, my feelings, and try to do the best thing for the people who are with me in, in the best way. Now, that said, I found that working with him, he was well, well organized, well organized. I mean, from... Uh, getting all the music together, writing and everything, getting all, feeling very comfortable, uh, having everybody feel very comfortable. He knew what kind of a personality he wanted to have presented as a group. Uh, how we looked was important to him. You know, he, again, he, 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 he was not a cheap man. He had quality. It's just that he didn't have the budget. And that was very, very special. Because he's saying, this is all I can do. And this is how we, so I've got, we've got to work within these, these parameters here. I want to get the most out of everybody, including myself, that we can. And we get up on the bandstand because he was so organized, and we would just play our butts off because the music was just swinging <laughs> from, from the very first note. There was something there to grasp. There was something there to bite onto. And that was what Horace has taught me. And when we played every night, six nights, for maybe sometimes two weeks, three weeks, you know, those were back. Those were the days when, you know, a band could have uh, a, a concert date, uh, and somehow uh, just stay in one place for a long period of time. You can't do that now, uh, and people would not. Again, another reason you had the economic side. Buildings, rents, and all of that are much, much more now. Mm-hmm. Uh, a club pays a lot more money to stay open than they did back in in the '60s. You know when I was playing. So that's to be understood. Uh, so a one nighter, boy, that band better be burning. You know, and and to to earn this space because everybody's paying a lot more money to come and even just watch to stay and operate this place for that one night. Uh, so it, there's a greater uh, commitment and, and, uh, comp- and a higher level of competition, uh, on not just from the musical standpoint and what the artist has to offer, but also the people representing the artist. Now, they're going to pull their politics, whatever, and if they can hoodwink a club owner into saying, to taking on their their artists, it's money in their pocket, and let's not. So, so you've got that combine working against the small independents, who maybe have only the the actual raw talent uh, to present. So they tend to fall by the wayside unless they've done their homework, yeah. like a Horace Silver, and he comes and they say, "Okay, this is what I've got to offer." My band rehearsed. We had this together. We not not just one or two tunes. We have comp, uh, songs that relate to each other over a period of let's say average ninety minutes. Uh, we can do two uh, if we want. We can break it down. And we can do a fifty minute show. We can do two fifty minute shows. Well, any way you want it, man. We've got this, and we actually sound good doing it. Uh, we have a presentation. It, 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 and it's more, you want to hear us? Good. 
you want to see us? Okay. You know, but it's about what we sound like because we're about, you know, in terms of being instrumentalists, that's what we're about. We don't sing, we play. You know, and not to say the singers are different than other musicians, but we're not putting on an act. We're not in that terms, in terms of that. We don't have lighting. We don't have any of that. We just come and put our hearts on the line. Um, that's another one, Horace Silver. You know, can I ask you? I just want to. I want to you know? jump in. I want to jump in. That's what it's all about. I want to jump in for a second because part of the fascination with with me towards your generation um, is the people, is knowing the mm-hmm. pe- is knowing the people, knowing you guys, and and, and that's the thing. It, it's about yeah, you want to burn and you want to. I mean, it, it's important. The music is really exceptional now because, like you said, you have a one night chance. But wouldn't it be? Uh, it, doesn't it hurt? Part of it is that Fibaracci, Husband, Cobham, Dean. I mean, if you guys, if let's just go back to the Horace Silver days, you know, with your group. I mean, if I was in the in the crowd, I'd be able to get to know you guys a little bit. Not personally, yeah. but I mean, you get to know the person, man. And I just feel like it, people nowadays, they listen to music, it, modern music and the way it's made is to pacify and it's music yet there are people making it and those people are intoxicating as it relates to who they are as human beings and I wanted to get that's something that you can't do in a night because you're gone you're up to Phoenix you're up to Vegas you know that to me is the part that it's the per the personalities are as addictive as the music to me and I feel like that's one of the things that's that's hard to you can't do anything about it in a one night stand you know Right, right. It's very, very difficult. Yet at the same time, that's here in America. If you go to Europe, people will remember you for that one night stand. And they will remember everybody in the band. They will remember uh, what they did, on what songs, which songs they played, okay, uh, and, and how it affected them. I've, I've had, on many, many occasions, people come to me and say, you know, the last time you played, <laughs> you brought tears to my eyes on Heather, or you brought tears to my eyes or, or, on, on this song or that song. Uh, it really was wonderful, the, 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 the approach, the, the, the way you guys worked at the band plays. Not Dean Brown or, or Rick Farabracci or Gary Husband. Not the solos, the band. The band sounded good. And that's what I'm going for always. Mm-hmm. The band. That's because that's the impression, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that, that I feel should be left with an audience. The Billy Cobham Band, the organization that I put together uh, with my name on it, uh, came across to the people. Uh, and oh, by the way, yeah, uh, Billy was the drummer in the band, but it wasn't Billy the drummer that stood out. It was the band that stood out. Everybody played well. I dig. Um, did did uh, did Horace help you? Um, how, did he help you learn to swing? I, I, the only reason I ask you is uh, sometimes, like uh, going back to Lenny White when he started to play with Jackie McLean, McLean would yell at him and say, "No backbeat, no backbeat." And I'm wondering if if, uh, if 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 Horace was the type of guy who would who would bark at you and say no backbeat, Billy, no backbeat. No reason because I never had that. I developed that after Horace. I mean, I didn't have to use it. My whole thing was to play what was necessary. I, I was a jazz player first. I mean, a Latin player by by birth a jazz player after that, and all I did was just lay it down. If, I, if, if, you, if you hear me with Horace, there's a, for instance, there's one example. Uh, me playing with Horace, John B. Williams, Betty Moffin, and Bill Hartman at the Copenhagen Jazz Festival. That's right. And not one backbeat, man, but we're rocking <laughs> all the way down the road, you know? That's uh, right. To the point where... In the ten months that I worked with Mr. Silver, uh, there were it was, I experienced my first out of body experience, where I actually left my body on the bandstand, sat down in the audience, and watched me and the band play, 
and it scared me half to death. I didn't even understand. We were work. We had come be, come to a point that that I I never knew before. We were playing so in sync that it was all as if we were in slow motion. But I heard every note and everything worked perfectly for me, and I understood that this is a this something like this doesn't come every day or every maybe maybe it might only happen once in my life although i have now experienced it more than once in my life more than twice in my life but it has been on specific occasions and i i have to tell you man it's it's the most there are, there is no <clears throat> there is no reward there is no oscar for this except to be able to sit there and go wow that's amazing I never knew the band could sound like this. And again, it's the band, not Horace, not the Mahavishnu Orchestra, not the Billy Cobham Band, just the band. Everybody comes together and they play together. Um, mm. And when I'm playing straight ahead, when I'm playing with Horace, that's what the music called for. He didn't have to, I, I have, he was one of my teachers, Jackie McLean was another, by listening to them by watching what they did. That was important. And, and, and absorbing, taking the lessons, being observant, understanding what was happening, being in the studio with Miles, uh, feeling more than, it, it was always about doing, always about doing. How can we do this, make it feel good? Don't talk it, do it. Uh, right. but you have to understand what you need to do. <laughs> and sometimes, and, and, I mean, the thing is that what Miles did that terrified you but actually emboldened you was just, he didn't give you any time to think. He just said, you know, what you play yesterday? And you were scared and you played it. And yeah. like, That's not what you play, but I like that. Do it. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, yeah. I but, but Billy, you brought up something. I really was hoping you can go back and, and break down the, the Horace Silver uh, out-of-body experience. A part of me is also looking to uh, have you guys articulate about operating on that frequency, about playing the highest form of, you know, not just bebop, but in music, the highest form of music when you have to uh, literally leave your physical body. And most, some people, younger musicians, or it doesn't matter, just a lot of people, you know, people say, what are you talking about? You know, and, and just for the record, Billy Cobham has never done any drugs in his life so i mean you were as sober as anything and yet you had this experience and i think it's important for mu for the sustainability of music so if you said you had you've had it a couple times uh, could you tell could you talk about another time that you had this experience yes yes uh hopefully if if john will allow it to happen i don't know it's up to him and and we'll have to see if it'll work mm. but there's a there's a recording of of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, uh, I don't know how good it is. That's that's probably what you know. John will have to decide uh, if it if it really you know uh, meets muster. But uh, it's of us at the Olympia in Paris, and we were very tired, man. Uh, we had been on the road for maybe eight ten weeks. I don't know something like that between the United States and Europe. No, no real time off away from each other. We were just hitting it because the iron was very hot and we had to strike. <laughs> right. So we were do we were hitting it. We finally got to the last date before we had about two weeks off uh, before the next concert at Winterland, where we were. I think we were opening to uh, to Emerson Lake and Palmer or something like that, or or. Zappa, I don't know. <laughs> right. Bill Graham. Do, do we have a date? Seventy-two, seventy-three in that range. Some, some, some year. Uh, like? yeah, like, like, right, like around. Well, yeah, like around there, but in the summer. Sure. And and so next thing I know, I'm tired, and we're we're playing. It's now about two and a half hours into the show. Uh, normally we play about three, three and a half hour show. Uh, and it's one song after the next, one song after the next. And I might not play a little bit on, on, on a ballad like Lotus on the uh, on the stream or something. But we, I don't know what happened. 
everything, we were so synchronized, and this is what happens when you are so in tune to, to every, with the music and the individuals playing it, that much of what's going on becomes automatic. <laughs> and the, your body just sort of clicks in, or like your subconscious clicks into a period where it's making, it's running the body on automatic. It's like running the plane on automatic. And all of a sudden, the brain goes into a second mode where you actually go, and this is the only way I can explain it, you go away from it, and you can actually literally, like a ghost, you can watch everybody. I remember on the bandstands, mm. watching myself partially fall asleep uh, wow. on the snare drum oh. as we're playing, because I was tired. <laughs> yeah. But I saw everything happening around me, and I, I also realized, this. I we need to close this down because we need to catch a flight. I mean, all of this stuff was going on, and I'm thinking about managing the band, what we need to do. Elliot, uh, our road manager, where is he? What's he and we're playing to maybe something like 1,500 to 2,000 people jammed. It might have been the second show that afternoon. I don't know. But we were just in a zone, and everything was working. And it all seemed so comfortable. And when it was time to come out of this tune, we went right out of it and into, uh, I think it was Awakening and all, and that's when I woke up. And we started playing, and I was just right there. But I could remember everything that happened before then. And I wasn't on the band set. All spiritually, I was physically there. Everything was moving, everything was working. But I really wasn't there. I watched the whole. I watched that part of the show yeah. from outside of myself. No, you just you 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 just got me in farther into this where you said your brain goes into a second mode. This is fantastic. Yeah. This is and and Billy, um, why do you? Uh, it takes a certain. Res- everyone has to be respectful of each other. I, I don't want to sound trite at all because, but y- you know. Uh, whether you look at Return to Forever, I got Demiola coming up later, or your Mahavishnu, or your bands with, um, I mean, is it, do you find it uh, people are afraid to go there because they're not all in sync, a quartet or a quintet? I mean, why were those, why were those, why was there a propensity of bands when you were coming up in your prime that were so willing to go there? And, and why is that, or am I, why can't I find that today? Uh, because most bands don't have a chance to be together that long. Uh, the commitment is not there. Most of the musicians today, oh, I would say even from, I'd say from 1975 to the present, generally speaking, are all competing with each other, generally speaking, Mm -hmm. to get what one has, if it's not, if, if, if they're not equal. There are many musicians who talk about equality based on their, uh, their, their musical ability, and at the same time, they don't consider the fact that the person who, who uh, is in the band that hired them and invited them to take part on the project and is technically, if, they, if they want, you want to consider it from a business standpoint, their boss, they don't respect that person. They took the job because they saw an opportunity to, to show what they could do as individuals. And I have the first person to say, I was one of those people. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's out of desperation. Right. And, 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 that's partially out of direct desperation because you need the work. But the one thing that you forget is that the person who got you the work is one leg up on you because it was through their sources. And they love what you did enough and respected you enough to ask you to come and help them sustain their position that they are, if not move it forward. So the last thing you want to do is take that away from them. If anything, enhance their position, and at the same time, let them remember and recommend to those who may know. Hey, this guy's all right. You know, he's someone you can depend on. How you carry yourself is very, very important. Most musicians have no idea 
how to put that together. And I stand by my words. No, I, I really, I, really believe that. No, I'm, I'm, I... Um, so why... Why was it so... Why was there so much flexibility or lack of... I don't want to say lack of competition, but why... What, it just seemed to me Woody Shaw or Art Blakey, these guys were talent scouts, and they were... They were not in competition with each other. They were, I mean, they were to a degree. They actually were, were, were all raising each other's games, but they were all looking out for the younger generation too. So where, why did it, why by 75 did it become a free, kind of a frenzied free-for-all? Well, because a lot of people started to, uh, who were playing, started to look at uh, an incumbency in terms of the negative, a cancer, if you will, uh-huh in the society in which we all function within. And that cancer is called management. Okay? There are people who really, generally speaking, exploit uh, the musician, the artist. Mm -hmm. And it's not as if they have to intimidate or push themselves on any, any of these people. The artist actually invite these elements. They're good at what they do. They're doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, bishops, accountants, all kinds of people who have uh, a, a bunch of letters after their name. They've done this, they've done that. And they will work with you as long as they get theirs first. Okay? Right. Once that's over, see you later, man. It's on to somebody else. And you're a husk of your former self, standing there going, hey, I, I didn't know I had these bills. Where did that come from? Go talk to Joe Lewis and tell me what you think. You know, it's like, hey, that's gone, and, and that became the norm. Now it is not the norm, okay? You don't see so much of that anymore in the jazz environment because this, there's no money in the jazz environment, really, uh, unless the musicians who are there understand whom they've taken in to work with them. More often than not, many of these artists, like myself, again, we take family. Not that it's always the best thing to do, but people, at least you know who you're talking to. Yeah. And, no, if, yeah. and if everybody's up for it, somehow it can work out. Hmm. And that's what it's all about, man. No, I, it's just, you know, yeah, it's not like having the family. You're having the loyalty, you know, and you're and I, I, it's powerful, Billy. And um, you know, just the way I'm sure somebody, uh, I don't know, knew if Tom Dowd was in the studio and you know it was like Clapton and Dwayne Allman were playing, and he said, you know, this may not resonate right away, but 50 years from now, it's going to. Uh, I got to believe that the, the that philosophy, um. And it's about intentions too, uh, you know. But it, there was just it, it, it affected the music. It affected. It, it's quite remarkable as we, you know, talk to Billy Cobham here as you, as you break it down from that point of view, uh, that management point of view. You know, I have a question. Uh, you know, I've ta- I've inter- since I talked to you last time. I've interviewed just about everybody from the band called the Section. You know, uh, yes. okay, and uh, I just talked to Craig Durge, uh this week. I'm, I'm trying to lasso him in, and, and uh, he said to me that uh, the the song that you love the most. I want to see about your memory here uh, on their first album that you love was called "Same Old, Same Old." Do you remember that tune? Not not at the moment, but I, I know the name. I just can't remember how it goes. You, you just but said, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I like that band. They, they, you know they. They just had this family kind of thing, you know, with uh, starting with, with, with uh, Lee Sklar, who was like one of my all-time favorite bass players, for specific purposes. I mean, Lee had this this thing, you know. He was, you know, he, he, he just he even looked like the like the groove that he played, <laughs> you know. It, it, lo- just, it just was right there all the time. What, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Were you getting off on his stuff with uh, James Taylor? How did you know about him uh, when you brought him in for, when you decided to bring him in for, for Stratus? Uh, through James Taylor, through the section, because they were, they were with the same. That's right. I'm sorry. You know, you were, no, we were. No, and also they all to a man, Cor- Korchmar, Kunkel, 
yep. and Scar uh-huh. all talk about how how much of an impact you and that, that Mahavishnu band had on them because you went on tour with them in seventy two. Right. And uh right. they were they were I mean they 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 were trying to do things they were doing the best they could. You listen to Kunkel. I mean, it, it just to me it was like just you know, put me back and get me into that into that show and and get people to actually you really you know, I think that's the other part of it, Billy. I mean, you're probably not aware of this on stage with your quartet now. You know, you're just in the moment, you know, but um people's listening skills have really uh it's harder. You have to. You have to be. You have to perceive the music. You have to get deep into the music. And we're not really operating on a very deep level now. You know. And I, I just. I don't know if you sometimes you if you can, uh, as a musician, if you can feel that or not. Disengage from. Well, music. I don't think so, Jake. For me, I, I. I don't. I don't feel. I. I, I put out. I. I offer it to the band and the band as a whole when we when we share all of our information as a with that fan face, it's who we are based on who, where we've been, based on our combined history. And it's, it's amazing. And I wish you had heard us. Actually, it would have been nice to hear us with, with Goodman and then to hear us without Goodman. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it, when the next tour came back in 2014, and now, man, we're, we're in another world. We're in another zone. And it's, it has nothing to do with Jerry Goodman at all. It was like a, that was an idea, uh, and it wasn't going to work because the music just did not require one more uh, uh, major mind. We just needed the four people on the bandstand. Uh, and what we needed from the, uh, in order to make that happen, for me to stir this drink, was to understand what I had to work with and how to get everyone to feel comfortable about the direction in which we were going, which was to to contribute uh, music that connected and represented in some way what Spectrum was 40-plus years before without being exactly that. And here we are. Right. You know, oh, well, I mean, and that's yeah. important. Well, um, uh, you know, I wanted to save a little bit of time. Um, I wanted to put in this track of music for you, and then uh, and then we'll uh-huh. come back and break it down. Okay. Okay. Oh, my God. 
Music on the Jake Feinberg Show, sponsored in part by Abbott Taylor Jewelers, the Stereo Hospital, Circle Tree Ranch, and Dee's Island Grill. Um, Mr. Cobham, do you want to take a gander at what that was? Uh, that was George and and Skull and uh, Alfonso Johnson. That's right. I can't remember the name of the tune. That was George's tune. That's George. Oh, yeah, I, no, I was searching, scrambling for a set list, uh, but Skull... Duke and Al Johnson and Billy Cobb, 1976 Montreux Jazz Festival. And, um, you know, thank God for technology. And people put, decided to throw a, a recording tape in there so we could get it. Um, but, Billy, I, I, you know, I really wanted to take the remainder of our time and just talk about the first time that you uh, got a chance to uh, meet or play with George and then uh, ultimately your friend, your relationship because. Uh, he was one of my first interviews. I did it when I was still teaching in a classroom. I did. He was just the ultimate gentleman, such a great guy and such a gutty, such a gut bucket guy. And uh, and now that I've been able to talk to you so much, I was like, you know, I never talked to Billy about George. So the floor is yours, my friend. Tell me about Mr. Duke. Well, I, I met George Duke for the first time that I can remember now. Uh, and please keep in mind, everybody, this is short-term memory loss. <laughs> going. It's all right. But, but, but what, happened, what I can remember is running into George at a place called Slugs in the Far East uh, with, with Cannonball Adderley. I don't know why. It was like a, a group of people, and Bill Evans was there. I don't know what was happening. Wait, Why George slugs, would be there? Slugs, I don't uh, know. The slugs, the slugs jazz club. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll tell you. No, I'll tell you right now. Exactly. Yeah. I, no, no. It was Cannon and Nat. George was playing key, right. keyboards. It was keyboards. It was, yeah. it was Walter Brooker and McCurdy. Um, it was, right. That was the band, and seven. And so you're spot on. That would have been like '73. I mean, Ayerto might have been there. Buck Clark. Who knows? But that's yeah. You're spot on. Yeah. And the thing was, was that. In, in the audience or, or in the group that came outside was also Bill Evans. And, <laughs> and we were all just talking on the corner, you know. Right. And that's how I, I kind of met George as being this piano player in, 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 in Canada's band. And, and I, had, I mean, these are cats that I, I didn't talk to that much. It was just different different uh, groups. And I don't know, I, I was around town. I was just a young, I was doing my thing with the orchestra, but that was about it. And next thing you know, ah. We're on a concert, and the opening, and we are opening for, uh, man, this 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 pop pop uh, band whose name, if I if I had remembered, you would know exactly. <laughs> and it's a beautiful it day. A, it's main, a beautiful day. The track, it was like one of something like this. Yeah, right. And it was one. It was one guy. You know, right. He didn't do. He was a kind of a guitar player. He had a, he, he, he made a, he, 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 he just spent a lot of time on a very, very simple but effective piece of material that sold to a lot of people, no problem. Mm -hmm. And then the second act was Cannonball, Cannonball Adderley with Nat Adderley, and George is playing. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next, the opening act was the Mahavishnu Orchestra. This was at the Beacon Theater in New York. Wow. Okay, we had two shows that night. Okay, now, no, they, George was aware of, of me. I think they had gone to Brazil, and that's where they, they heard the M.O., uh, George had heard the music, and he was telling everybody about it. Of course, it's like, until you, until you experience it, talk, words don't describe what we were about. Mm -hmm. So, we come on stage, John does the uh, few minutes of silent bit, and then all hell breaks loose. And the next thing you know, we finish, and everybody starts to leave in the audience. They all are leaving because they don't even know, they don't want to know about who else is playing. And they figured that the show was over. So someone comes on and says, now, don't forget... We've still got uh, Cannonball Adderley's uh, group, and uh, I forget this this pop singer, whoever. And the pop singer now is scared to death. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, was it like 
Feliciano or something? <laughs> I mean, this no, is, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I wish I could remember. It's all right. Man, it's but, all right. I mean, yeah. yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. The next thing you know, the management and all of the people, because uh, this was like, it was a, a, a promotional organization called New Audiences that was promoting this back in New York back in that time. And they come on and go, listen, we got to fix something, man, because otherwise we're going to lose everybody. Uh, no one wants to stay for the other two acts. So how about we do this? Why, how about Cannon and this other rock singer, whoever it was, why, how about they go on first and you guys close the second show because no one really wants to see them anyway. And so that's what we did. We hung out. Waited until Cannon and, and George, they, they, they played. And as soon as that was gone, that was over. Next thing you know, uh, and we finished, the next thing happened is that uh, we came out and all of the people who were outside came back inside for the second show for us. And George, even the band even stayed. The other band stayed and were in the audience while they watched us. Holy cow. And, oh. and it all turned around just like that. Uh, we had very, very few people who played after us and very few people who wanted to play after us and very, very few, <laughs> few bands who even played before us. The only band yeah. that I know, the only one-man band that ever did both was a guy by the name of Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. wow. He's the only cat that could open to us and then also close to us. And all he did it with was a dobro and that voice, and he just told stories. And it didn't really matter whether we opened. It did, he was, we would stay for him. One, you know, one, or, man, one man band. He had no more one than man just, band. oh, my God. That was just him. And the other band was Edgar Winters' White Trash. That's it. Hmm. That's great. They, they could hit... Yeah, that's it. Everybody else, no, man, let's not do that. You know? <laughs> no, we don't want to do that. No, don't want to do it. Even Zappa, you know, you know, it was like well, I it was about yeah. ego. Well, no, I know? assume that 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 I kind of was guessing that that you and you guys wound mo wound up on a bill with with Zappa, and that's how you because uh, at the same time that George was playing with Cannon, he was with Frank, but. Um, I, this, this is phenomenal. I just, you know what it is? I can see the love that you guys on, on the stage, you guys were so in sync uh, with Al and, and Sco. You guys were listening to each other, but I mean, just to have you and George just, I mean, then you guys got down and just started cooking. You made a bunch of, a couple albums together. So it really was just an immediate synchronicity. Once that happened, you guys were connected for life, right? Yeah, it was, you know, it's, it's, it's re it was really, even, as a matter of fact, we, after that, we didn't play so much together anymore because George had all these hit records that he was doing and, and he had his own aggregation and he was doing his own thing. No problem. What was really interesting is that then he would invite me to come to Moltra to just be a, his guest. Okay, so I'd come and we would have not played since 1987. And the Moltra project was 1998. And he just, you know, it was like the day before we had met and we played. So there was no problem. He had some stuff. I had some stuff. We put it together. And it worked out very well. No problem. Well, Billy, I'm uh, looking forward to meeting you in person when you come down here. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to see the band. Uh, just uh, delighted that uh, you uh, pushed up your, your itinerary in Arizona nine months uh, or thereabouts. And uh, thank you for just continuing to uh, enlighten and take the time uh, because it's all going to, it's all, it's all coming back around long after we're all gone, my friend. So thank you, brother. My pleasure, Jacob. Looking forward to seeing you, man. Me too, man. Have a beautiful weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. All, All right. the best to everybody. All right now. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks. We'll be right back. <laughs> 